We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Father Meyer. For those of you who are family and friends, uh, those who have been on pilgrimage, or for those of you who uh, just heard about tonight's presentation and decided to show up, I'm the pastor here at All Saints Parish. I've had the honor for the last two summers to bring pilgrims from All Saints Parish and friends of people from All Saints Parish to the Holy Land. And it has been unbelievable, tremendously transformative in, in the very true sense of what trans meaning to change and form, uh, the change in our form of who we are. Uh, so what I'd like to do tonight uh, is show a PowerPoint presentation which takes us through the mystery the Mysteries of the Rosary, so 20 Mysteries of the Rosary, and all of them are in the Holy Land, except for the last one, where Mary is crowned Queen of Heaven and Earth. We have to go to Heaven to see that. But the rest of them are all tangibly on Earth, and so for those of you who have never been to the Holy Land, uh, this is a great way to kind of experience the Holy Land through pictures. I'll tell a little bit about the sites as well. For those of you who have been to the Holy Land, like, this is going to trigger off every memory of your pilgrimage, of the sights and the sounds and the smells and the experiences uh, that you have in that very, very sacred place. And then afterwards, uh, we can kind of give you a little short Q&A and so forth. And then some of the people, some of our pilgrims, have brought uh, their treasures that they obtained in the Holy Land this, uh, in the various pilgrimages. So you can take a look at those because it really is. So let's begin with a prayer because that's important. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Gracious Father, we thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who was conceived in Nazareth, who was born in Bethlehem, who fled to Egypt in persecution, who was presented in the temple in Jerusalem, who was baptized in the river Jordan, who performed a miracle in Cana in Galilee, worked miracles and wonders on the Sea of Galilee and Capernaum, in the many regions, in the many cities in that region. We thank you and praise you for your son Jesus who allowed himself to give his body and blood in the upper room, to suffer, to be arrested and crucified. He was buried in a tomb, he rose from the grave, he ascended into heaven sent the Holy Spirit upon the apostles in that upper room. Commission them to go for it. We pray that this presentation tonight may send us forth to be your witnesses in the world and may help us to be saints in your kingdom. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We press record on this. Uh, we were asked to record tonight's presentation because some people couldn't be here that wanted to be here recorded it last year and it was a great benefit uh, to some individuals. So, uh, hopefully in my prayer tonight, for those of you who have been to the Holy Land, and it's, I, th I think it, for me one of the most powerful parts of going to the Holy Land is you understand geographically and regionally like where all these places are, they become very tangible. So we'll see that. So, this is this year's pilgrim group. This is uh, the photograph that was taken of us in Bethlehem in front of the church. Uh, of the Nativity, uh, which is connected to the Church of St. Catherine, uh, which is the Latin, the Catholic Church that is in there in Bethlehem that marks the spot of our Lord's birth. It also marks the location where St. Jerome translated the earliest text of the Bible into Latin, which is now known as the Latin Vulgate. You see uh, our group here. Uh, this is on our the day when we not only had tremendous prayer, but it was also the day where their bank accounts were completely depleted. Uh, because when you go to the Holy Land, you do all of your shopping in Bethlehem. Uh, those fluorescent lights are on. That switch over here, Paul. Thank you. You do all your shopping in Bethlehem because that's the largest conglomeration of, of Christians are in Bethlehem. And so you put off all shopping to Bethlehem so we can support the Christians and keep the money in the hands of the Christians. Because the Muslims and everybody else are selling the exact same things. Uh, but we want to support those who need the money that are our brothers and sisters. So there were 42 people on our pilgrimage this past year, and uh, it was a great group, and here they are. Very young group, 
I mean, actually, this, during the festivals we've been running, there's so many people, like, uh, last year we had 70, how many of our group last year? 70, 76 last year. The only person under the age of 30 was Nick Bischoff. I had one server at all the masses. This year, we had a group of 42, and 25% of them, like 11 of them, were under the age of, like, 25. It was awesome. So, like, just, like, totally, and that, that changes the trip, because the people make the trip. So, like, it's different experiences, different opportunities. So, it was it was great to see to see that. So, all pilgrims start, uh, to the Holy Night start with the, the, the long trip over the, the seas, and uh, we arrived very safely. I am not taking you through what happened. I'm taking you through the mysteries of the Rosary. So this is not how we experience the Holy Land, but this is the only way in my mind to comprehend the Holy Land. It just gets too confusing that way. So I started the first joyful mystery, which is the Annunciation, where Mary was greeted by the angel Gabriel. This is the Church of the Annunciation. Uh, you see on the front, it says, in verbo caro factum s, caro, this is the word for like carnivore, factum s was made here. God was made flesh right here. That is the the bell tower on top of the church. It's supposed to look like an upside down tulip. Mary is often symbolized as a, not a tulip, uh, a, a lily. Mary symbolizes a lily for her purity. So they, they shape the bell tower like a, a lily. This is inside the church. This is what's known as the grotto or the cave. I believe that Mary lived in a cave dwelling, which, like many people did in Nazareth, through the archaeological research that they've done. And where the light is coming from, we'll see some other pictures of that. But that is actually, to believe, the, the place where Mary was when the angel visited her. This is in there, the cave dwelling. And then this marks the spot. So in the Holy Land, all of the sacred places normally have a particular spot where you can actually touch that is believed to be the exact spot that this mystery of our faith took place. And I always use the analogy of people are like, well, how do we know? Like, that's crazy. Like, how would we know 2,000 years later where this took place? And I always ask the question, ladies, do you know where you gave birth to your child? I remember, of course I do. do you know where your husband proposed to you? Of course you do. Would Mary know where an angel appeared to her in the middle of the day and told her that she was going to see conceive the Son of God? Of course she would. Would she have told me what is? Of course she would. Would all the twelve apostles have known? Yes. Would they have shown people? Yes. Would the earliest of Christians have started going there and venerating that, that spot from the very moment that Jesus rose from the grave. Yes. People go to Graceland to honor the place of Elvis. We are we are idiots if we don't believe that people would also go and honor the place uh, that our Lord was actually conceived in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. On this spot, so for those of you who are familiar with the with the Angelus, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. In Latin, that's verbo caro factum s. In Latin, they add the word hic, which means the word was made flesh here. At this very spot, the word became flesh. Uh, so for those people who know Latin, that's always kind of a very powerful moment when they pray at that spot there. We pray the Angelus there. Uh, we had the opportunity this, uh, to, to pray the Angelus with the Franciscan friars. They do it every single day at 12 o'clock noon. They chant it. It's very, it's very beautiful. They have a little procession with incense. We had mass this year in the Basilica of the Annunciation, directly above the grotto. It was unbelievably powerful, powerful mass. Uh, the upper church is actually very modern. It has mosaics from all over the world, uh, different countries that have donated images of the Blessed Mother. Uh, but this is uh, this is the church of the Annunciation. The second joyful mystery is the visitation. So after Mary conceived, she goes she goes in haste and travels to the hill country and visits her cousin Elizabeth. To go to the church of the visitation, you have to literally climb up what seems like a mountain. It's not really a mountain, but it, in the middle of uh, July, it seems like a mountain. It's a, it's a very, very steep hill. And so you climb up to this, the top of this hill, and this is where Mary uh, greeted her cousin Elizabeth. There's miracles attached with this, with, with this place. A spring is believed to have come up out of the ground. 
This location is also believed to be the place where Mary, sorry, where Elizabeth hid John the Baptist during the, during the slaughter of all the children by King Herod. So there's actually a rock that Elizabeth hid John the Baptist under and protected him from, uh, from the soldiers that were sent out by King Herod. This is the this is the, the interior of the church that, that's there. Mary, this is supposed to be Mary kind of walking from Nazareth to this town called Ein Karnum, walking across the Judean wilderness. Uh, in the back of the church is very kind of this very powerful modern image of the Blessed Virgin Mary. This is would be depicted from uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 12. The woman clothed in the sun. This is a, a beautiful uh, statue outside. Of, Mary, of the two pregnant women, Mary and Elizabeth, greet each other. You see both of them uh, really filled with joy. Of course, after the visitation, uh, Mary then travels back to Nazareth, and then because of the census, she's forced with Joseph to go to Bethlehem, where they are to give birth to the child. This is the church that we were in, and we had our picture taken in front of, in front of this, if you, if you that, that first picture that I showed you. This is our group getting ready to go underground. Those of you who have seen my caves that we build at Christmas time, we don't put Jesus in a stable. You can put Jesus, you can put Jesus wherever you want, because Jesus is everywhere. But Jesus was not born in a stable. If you want to believe that, you can, but it's wrong. Jesus was born in a cave. There's a whole lot of like great biblical reasons why Jesus was born in a cave. We, the reason we put Jesus in a stable is because we're Western, and we, we house animals in stables. But Jesus was really born in a cave. So you go down underground and you go to the niche or to the cave. Uh, and this is us getting ready to descend the stairs to go down underground. This is the spot that marks the exact location where Jesus was born of Mary and the Word became flesh in visible form. Uh, here's two of our pilgrims uh, posing to have their picture. You also see. A lot of people will place their religious objects, so some of you may have been gifted a cross or a, a, a rosary or something, someone who uh, wanted the Holy Land. So a lot of people come down and they, they, they touch these actual locations. This is, uh, she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. We had mass in Shepherd's Field, which is where the shepherds were when the angels came to them. This is actually a small cave that we, that we had masked in, in the shepherd's field. And uh, really, a, a, to me, it's very one of the very, very powerful places. It's a hillside with caves. And you can very much so easily use your imagination and see shepherds and sheep. And, uh, and it's July, but we sang all Christmas songs. It's, well, actually, it was June. It was June. But um, at all of the sites, the Mass you celebrate at the location is the Mass of that feast. So when you're at the Annunciation, the Mass is of the Annunciation. You sing all Mary songs. And at, when you're at the Nativity, it's, it's Christmas Day. So all of the Masses are of the liturgical season. So you literally go through the whole liturgical year like in a week. It's, it's pretty perfect. Then we go to a place called the Milk Grotto, where Mary breastfed Jesus for 40 days prior to him being presented in the temple. So we have to just like follow the, the, the chronology of the, of the Bible. The flight to Egypt could not have taken place until Jesus had been presented in the temple, which we know was 40 days after his birth. So where did Mary and Joseph live? They lived in a cave. It's just about maybe a half mile from where he was born. They moved out of where he was born and they went and found another dwelling place. It's called the Milk Grotto. There are also nuns there that, that keep perpetual adoration, which is powerful for us because we have a perpetual adoration chapel uh, and we can pray with these religious sisters that are there. The fourth and the fifth joyful mystery, there, there is not a religious site for us to visit because both of these mysteries take place in the temple. But the temple has been completely, totally destroyed. So the temple in Jerusalem, which is where 
they offered, which is where the Ark of the Covenant would have been, where they offered animal sacrifices, is, has been completely destroyed since the year 70 AD. It doesn't exist anymore. Not a stone upon a stone. So the picture, the, the images that I'm showing you are actually just kind of some remnants. These are, these are the exterior walls of the old city of Jerusalem. These here are the gates that would have led, led into the temple on the east side of the city. This is what is now on the temple. So when I say on the temple, they use the foundation stones of the temple to build this, which is known as the Dome of the Rock, which is a Muslim mosque. So the temple property is now owned by the Muslims. And Jews are not allowed to even step foot onto the property. If they do, they are considered to be defiled. So if you're a faithful Jew, you would never even ever step onto what you consider in your heart to be the most sacred ground in all of Jewish history. Going to going to Israel and talk to anybody who you will you will receive a history and understanding of world religions that you never ever ever could understand here in America by reading the book. But the conflict is very real and it's terribly sad. Uh, finding it of Jesus in the temple. So this is the Wailing Wall, uh, which is not really part of the temple. It's, it's, a, it's a foundation wall that would have been under the ground, that would have supported the, 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 the base of the temple. So this is where the Jews go, and why are they wailing? Because they have no temple. What do the Jews want back? A temple. Because the Jews are actually not really Jewish anymore. Because they don't have animal sacrifice. They don't have there is no cultic worship anymore. All they have is the Bible and the singing. They, there, there is no ritual in their religion. Um, so this is the Wailing Wall, which uh, which we make a pilgrimage to. There's some Jewish boys here praying. This I put this image here because when in the when they when they uh, there's the prediction at the temple by Simeon that a sword will pierce your your own so, your, your, your own heart. Mary's heart would be pierced with a sword. This is a picture of a statue, which we'll see later, of Mary's heart being pierced. Uh, these are some of our ladies actually at the wall. The, the men and women at the wall are not allowed to, in fact, it, it, it's of a recent era that women have been allowed to actually approach the wall, uh, the Jewish women. But they now have a women's section and a men's section. Uh, Jews don't believe in like intermingling uh, during worship. Those are some of our women praying at the wall. That's me praying between two Israeli soldiers. Baptism of Jesus. Uh, so this is the first luminous mystery at the River Jordan. We had an opportunity this year. Every time I go to the pilgrimage, there's always something different. This is my fifth time. I have always gone to what is kind of like the I call it the commercial Disneyland site for the the baptism site. It's not the historical site where Jesus was baptized. The one that I've always been to before is like a commercial center. You walk through a store to go get to the water, and you walk out of the store to get out of the water, and it's all like picturesque. And they've dammed up the water, and the water's all like clear, and you like it's beautiful. And there's like ramps down into the water, and you're like, ah, oh, this is beautiful. And this is the actual historical site where Jesus was baptized, and it's a war zone. It was a totally different. The water is like murky, and they're literally going directly through a river. Is an international border with Syria? Is that correct? With, sorry, sorry. With Jordan, with gun soldiers on both sides, with huge signs saying "Do not touch that international border, or you will be shot." Um, so this is, but it, it was. I, I found it tremendously powerful. For those who have never been to the other one, like it doesn't matter. Says, like it was the River Jordan, and we were there, and we threw our baptismal promises, and we sang songs about Jesus' baptism, which was awesome. Uh, but definitely, uh, to me, it was just very powerful knowing that like this is the spot that Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. So it's a different feel, but nonetheless, that line is, is that is that yes. 
Yeah. Yeah, there were snipers. It was awesome. <laughs> and speaking of pictures of the soldiers, here we go. There we go, pictures of the soldiers. It was awesome. They, they thought that my hat was cool, too. Um, okay, so Jesus is baptized. He then begins his public ministry. The first miracle of Jesus works is the wedding at Cana. So we go to Cana. Cana is very close to Nazareth. Uh, and going to Cana is always very, very powerful. I mean, it, it is, of course, powerful for those who are married, but it's also powerful. I mean, this is where Jesus began his, his miracle work. This is where Jesus showed his power over substance. If you can change water into wine, you can change wine into his blood. This is this is really the initiation of, of, of so much. So this is the interior of the church there. You see the stone water jars, and um, these are the individuals that renewed their wedding vows that were with us that day, uh, which is very beautiful for couples to renew their wedding vows. In Cana, in Galilee, they get a little certificate that gets signed. Uh, that's just a close-up of the picture. You have Jesus, and here's the bride and groom. He's telling the servers to go and uh, have the water change the wine. The third luminous mystery is the proclamation of the kingdom. There is no like specific site for the proclamation of the kingdom, so I always just refer to it as really kind of the whole Sea of Galilee and everything that, that takes place uh, within that region. So this is a picture of the Sea of Galilee from our hotel. Uh, our hotel was literally right on the Sea of Galilee. We could actually uh, go swimming in the Sea of Galilee from our hotel. Uh, this is the, this weekend we had the story of the multiplication of loaves and fishes. This is that church. So literally, this rock is the is the spot where Jesus was sitting uh, and multiplied the loaves and the fish. This is a very very famous mosaic that they made directly in front of the multiplication of the loaves and fishes rock. How many loaves do we see here? One, two. Three, four. How many loaves were there in this weekend's gospel? So where would the fifth loaf be? On the altar, which is Jesus in the Eucharist. Uh, very, very ancient mosaic. The whole floors of the church are full of mosaics. Now we're in Capernaum, where you have Peter's house. And this is the archaeological ruins. It actually is Peter's house. They've actually built the church on top of the house. It's almost like a spaceship. So this church is actually hovering over the archaeological ruins of Peter's house, which was the first house church ever. So this is the first place. So Jesus worked a miracle there of healing uh, Peter's mother-in-law, and they believe that this would have then kind of become the base of Christianity uh, on the Sea of Galilee. There's a lot of archaeological ruins there. One of them is a synagogue where it's the synagogue of Capernaum, where Jesus uh, proclaimed the Last Supper Discourse. So beginning this weekend, we will be in John chapter 6 for the next four Sundays in a row. John chapter 6 is what Jesus proclaimed in the synagogue in Capernaum, where he says that my flesh is true fruit, my blood is true drink. Unless you eat the flesh of the man, the son of the man, and drink his blood, you have the life of it. Tremendously powerful to pray there and to sing there. So we did a lot of that. That is the synagogue right there. It's called the first one is the White Synagogue. Also on the Sea of Galilee is the Mount of Beatitudes. So this is uh, this is the, the church. The that, the that center dome there has eight sides to it, and inside of it, in stained glass, are one of each of the Beatitudes. You celebrate Mass outside here on the Sea of Galilee. So this is us celebrating Mass, uh, looking the. Our, our people, our congregation, were actually looking at the Sea of Galilee throughout the whole entire mass. Very beautiful, except for the elder club. Uh, I complained to the sisters, don't worry. So this is, uh, I mean, it's, it, and the gardens at this, at, at this particular site are just magnificent. Just, it's everything you would want to think about of where Jesus would preach the Sermon on the Mount. This is, uh, this is the Mensa Christi. This is where Jesus ate breakfast with his, with his disciples after he rose from the dead and he reconciles with Peter. And he says to Peter three times, do you love me? Yes, I love you. 
Levi Sheep, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Feed my sheep, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Uh, tend my flock, feed my sheep. So this is the reconciliation of Peter and Jesus. It's also where Peter gave authority, where, where Jesus gave authority to Peter to shepherd the flock. This is just a look from the Sermon on the Mount. This is a picture on the Sea of Galilee. Speaking of the Sea of Galilee, of course, you can take a morning boat ride or an afternoon boat ride. Ours is a morning boat ride, so uh, we start our day off that day actually with uh, a little float. Uh, there we go. There's some more ladies. Uh, the Sea of Galilee boat ride is, 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 is one of these. There's a, there's a lot of this in the Holy Land where it's intensely religious very powerful at the next moment. It's like tremendous joy and just happiness in the city. So the, the, the boat ride drivers are very big. Like whatever nation you're from, they hoist the flag up there and play the national anthem. And the, the boat drivers actually come out and teach everybody how to dance. And you're on the boat in the Sea of Galilee, like going around in circles, dancing. And it really is just a great time. Fourth Luminous Mystery, the Transfiguration. So there is Mount Tabor, which is a very, very high mountain. It's actually very close to the Sea of Galilee. It's not on the Sea of Galilee, but it's, it's, it's close to the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus was transfigured. We're with Peter, James, and John. This is the church that is on top of that mountain. This is the view from the top of that mountain. Uh, our big buses, which fit 50 to 60 people on them, cannot make the, it's, it's a switchback all the way up to the top of the mountain. They, they can't make the turns. They're, they're, sh they're so sharp. So they put in these tiny little taxis, which are life-threatening. Um, but you just hold on and pray. It helps you to pray when you're in the Holy Land when you get those taxis. So the, the, the sight from up there is unbelievable. Uh, it's very, and it's so peaceful, and the wind is blowing your face. And it, people that Peter says in Scripture, uh, he says, Lord, how good it is that we are here. Like, Peter doesn't want to go down the mountain. And I think anybody that I've ever gone up to Mount Tabor with, they don't want to go down. Because it is unbelievable. We never have, there's never enough time. This is the interior of the church. You actually see the cute little Franciscan priest up there. Uh, this is the marvelous mosaic of, you see, Peter, James, and John, our Lord, and then Moses and Elijah who appear with him. There are tiny little chapels. This is Moses with the Ten Commandments and Elijah offering the sacrifice. His sacrifice is being consumed. The sacrifice of the Baals. The God Baal is not being consumed. Speaking of Elijah, uh, we do go to a lot of sites that involve Elijah. So Elijah appears with our Lord on, uh, on Mount Tabor. We also go to the site where Elijah actually slayed the 400 50 prophets of Baal, which is like one of my favorite biblical passages in the Old Testament, and I love going there. So we, uh, it's a very, very small chapel there run by the Carmelites, so we go there and pray. We also go to the cave of Elijah, which is known as Mount Carmel, and we had mass there, the mass uh, at, uh, to Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the founder of the Carmelites, the St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of the Sioux, uh, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross. Uh, this is the mother house of the Carmelites. This is a beautiful, beautiful statue above that cave where Elijah dwelt. Jesus institutes the Eucharist. Uh, this has actually been very powerful for me just with putting the, together the Last Supper exhibit. Uh, I think I have a, a, a deeper and deeper appreciation for the upper room and for all that took place there particularly through the sacred art that I've been able to set up and take down and set up and take down and set up and take down. Um, and we'll be setting up and taking down one more time. Uh, so this is the upper room. This is where God changed the world in tremendous ways. Uh, the upper room is not property of the church or of Christians. It is property of the Muslims. You have to actually pay a fee to get in. It was a mosque at one time. Uh, However, there are a few Christian symbols that are still in it. This is actually 
from the preaching pulpit that was in there. This is actually uh, the story of the Pelicans. For the Lord, be honest, for the Lord, we read the churches. I painted this at St. Paul's. It's above the green window on the right. I painted this image of the Pelicans. It is the story that a mother pelican would literally pack into her chest and feed her young, her own flesh and blood, which is the church. The church feeds the flesh and blood of Christ to her young. First Sorrowful Mystery of the Agony in the Garden, which is Hortus Gethsemane. This is above the door. I can't remember the door here. This is above the door while you're walking into the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Hortus Horticulture, Garden of Gethsemane. On Holy Thursday night, I actually had uh, one of our first ones, Ray Johnson, he actually, I had him make a copy of this. So on Holy Thursday night, when you go to our two gardens at St. Paul's and at St. Joseph, this is this greets you right when you walk in. I, I want people to understand what, what the what, why we have adoration on Holy Thursday night until Father Mark is that it is the Garden of Gethsemane, it's where our Lord was until Father Mark Denham was arrested and taken away. So the Garden of Gethsemane has uh, olive trees. Olive trees uh, are tremendously durable plants. They can last for thousands of years. So it is possible that some of these trees or their sprouts that uh, an olive tree actually hollows itself out in the middle and continues to grow from the inside out and uh, are, were alive 2,000 years ago. There's a church also on the spot. This is the, the apse or what's behind the altar in the tabernacle. And it says, uh, Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, that not my will but yours be done. This is the actual spot. This is the rock where our Lord sweat drops of blood, and I've never seen this before in my life. But, and I've only been here my time, and I've been right there every day. <laughs> but, like, it was very powerful. Someone had come earlier that day and put fresh rose puddles all over the rock as a symbol of our Lord's blood. Because when our Lord was there at the egg of the garden, it says very clearly that our Lord sweat drops of blood. And for those of you who have done the history and know the, 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 the anatomy and the biology and the understanding of what took place. Our Lord, there is actually a medical condition where there's so much stress and anguish, you literally do sweat blood. And uh, it was very powerful. I never, every time you, every time you go to the Holy Land, there's something different that catches your eye. It's, it's very, very moving. But so this is that, uh, this is the, the church of all nations. On, we entered into the sorrowful mystery, so there's a lot of things that I'm just kind of inserting in here. On the way to the Garden of Gethsemane and on the way back from the Garden of Gethsemane, there are steps that are that are over over 2,000 years old, which would have been the only path from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane to the Garden of Gethsemane back to where Jesus is held in prison that night by Caiaphas. And so you can actually see these steps where our Lord, we know for a fact, would have walked up and down seven. This is the church that marks the spot where our Lord uh, was taken into custody by Annas and Caiaphas and Sanhedrin on Holy Thursday night until Good Friday morning. It was, it was his first trial. There's three trials. There's Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. There's, there's Herod. There's Pilate. This is, uh, I actually don't have a picture of this one this year, so... They have, I, I'm a big fan of this picture, this statue, this beautiful statue of Peter sitting outside of Caiaphas' house, warming himself by the fire. You, have, you see the rooster up top. Our Lord uh, is scourged at the pillar, and uh, this is just a plaster relief showing that. And, uh, there are multiple claimings of the, the, the pillar that our Lord is scourged at. There's one in Rome, there's two in the Holy Land. Um, I used to give tours in Rome. I used to always off my tours by saying uh, there are stories that I will tell you today that are true and the stories that should be true. I will make no distinction between any of them. So when people ask me, like, hey, is that the pillar that our Lord is scourged at? I'm like, yeah. 
course it was. Like, just go and touch it and pray. Like, it doesn't matter. Like, just go touch it and it'll change your life. Um, actually, this slide should have been shifted back when I apologize. But, uh, in the house of Caiaphas, and it's tremendously powerful. I, like, I wish I had a better picture of this. Uh, our Lord was flogged. And uh, they archaeologically found in the house of Caiaphas a place where they would torture prisoners. And they have, you see here, they put the ropes there to kind of show you where the holes are. But that's where they would actually bound a man's hands up. And they actually have them for their feet down below as well. But they were actually, uh, one of the ways that they would torture them is actually uh, kind of suspending them and then uh, flogging them. Uh, this is not the flogging that he would have received from a flogging from Pilate, who would have also been tormented and flogged uh, by the temple guards and Caiaphas as well. This is a stained glass window in a church of the flagellation, which is the church where our Lord, that commemorates our Lord being flogged or whipped. This is uh, the pit, the old cistern that our Lord was dropped down into to be held in prison throughout the night. This is our group down in that cistern. There is no location, specific location for a car as well. This is a beautiful mosaic of the domes and churches. Which brings us to the carrying of the cross. So the roads have changed over the years, but the Christians have persisted in the the Via Dolorosa, which is the way of sorrows, the way of the cross, and there are literally markings along the journey. St. Francis of Assisi went to the Holy Land in the, in the 13th century, in the 1200s, and he walked the way of the cross and then brought it back to the West, to Europe, as a Catholic devotion. So no one prayed the Stations of the Cross until St. Francis of Assisi brought it, they prayed it in the Holy Land. No one knew it as a devotion until Francis of Assisi brought it back to the church uh, in the 1200s. And now, uh, it's one of the most famous devotions of the church after the rosary. So this is, uh, you can purchase a cross or rent a cross that the group that takes turns praying uh, all throughout the city. We sing songs, we say prayers, and uh, it's very, very powerful to walk the, the, the way of our Lord. I think our group would also say it's very, very powerful to also see uh, where where you carry the cross is actually through the Muslim quarter, uh, and you see the looks and the sneers and the disgust and the hate of humanity uh, in a very, very, very powerful way. And this past year, I would say, was probably one of the most uh, I think striking years as that being. So there are chapels along the way. For some reason, this year, every chapel except for one was closed. It, like None of the chapels were open along the way of the cross. So we, we still went on, and we, we were able to, there out, there's outside markers, you'll see those. But there are tiny little chapels. That it, for some reason, they, they, they were not open this year. So this is our group coming through the streets. The streets are very busy and loud and chaotic and noisy. So we're trying to pray, and they're trying to sell their shoes and their whatever else. So this is one of the tiny little chapels that marks the place where Jesus fell. This is the place that marks uh, the place where Jesus met our blessed mother, the fourth station. This is them carrying the cross again. Some of the, the markers are very, very small and simple. the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. So the last few of the stations are going to lead us actually into this church. This church is going to contain the beginning uh, from the 10th station on. This is one of the oldest churches in all of Christianity. It's been torn down and rebuilt and torn down and rebuilt. The Crusades, the 
originally built by St. Helen, the mother of the Emperor Constantine, uh, in the early, early 4th century. So from the outside, you go through these two big doors right here, and the first thing you run into is this, which is the anointing stone, where our Lord's body would have been laid and prepared by uh, the women, Mary, and Joseph, and Mary Magdalene. Of course, there were no lanterns, not marble. This is the location where our body, our Lord's body was prepared for burial. It's not in order. So just like follow where I'm going, give you a little interior tour. So you walk in this door, you see this. You go to your right. Oh, sorry. You pray here first. After you pray here, you go to your right, and there's a spiral staircase that takes you up like to like a second floor. It's maybe 15. 16 feet up in the air. That is Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary is not as all we think of in the movies. It is not a huge mountain. It is more like a mound. And this is where our Lord is crucified. You go up that spiral staircase and you see this chapel right here. We had the opportunity to celebrate Mass on Mount Calvary. Right here. So here's our group. We had Mass, I think it's 6 o'clock in the morning. I think something like that. We, had, we were up early. We, uh, there's, there's three altars on Mount Calvary. There's the altar of the crucifixion, the altar of our Blessed Mother, and then the, uh, actually, when I say crucifixion, like, we're, it, 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 the, uh, he's nailed to the cross. He's nailed to the cross. He's our Blessed Mother. The, where the, where the, the cross is put into the ground is actually right here. We'll get there in a second. So this is us celebrating Mass on Mount Calvary. I chose to say Mass at the altar of our Blessed Mother. This is the, the altar of our Blessed Mother right there. And then you can see off to the left, you see our, our crucified Lord there to, to the left of Our Lady here at the altar. This altar here is the altar that is over the very place where our Lord died. Roman Catholics are not allowed to celebrate Mass there. There's lots of scheduling things about who can celebrate Mass where. We are allowed to celebrate Mass at the two altars to the right of the actual place where our Lord died. That's the altar of our Blessed Mother with her sword, with her sword in her heart. This is the altar of the crucifixion. You see people going underneath the altar. Once again, you put there's a circle opening. You put your hand in there and it is believed to be the place where the cross was actually planted into the ground. On the left and the right, there's light. That actually is showing the actual bedrock of Calvary. So although it's all ornamented and beautiful, through that glass you can literally see the top of the mountain. It's very real. It's very, very real. It's a beautiful picture uh, that, yeah, that captures the artwork. Probably one of the best I've ever seen. I don't know who's going to argue took that picture, but kudos. Just some more pictures of, you can see the rock there. Really good on this one. See the actually this one is very pretty. So then you're up top of Mount Calvary. You then are going to go. You're going to descend the steps. You're going to carry Jesus from Mount Calvary. He's died. You're going to carry him down the mountain. You're going to lay him on the ground there. He's going to be anointed, prepared, put in the shroud of Turin. At that, it's just a burial cloth. It's not called the shroud of Turin yet. Then you're going to walk with his body this way to a tomb that Joseph of Arimathea is going to give you. So we're going that way. We're following that guy in the black. Oh, sorry. Ugh, darn it. Pray here for a little bit with your pilgrim group. So this is our group. Once again, like they're taking their crosses and their rosaries. They're, they're placing them on the anointing stone. And then you go around the corner and you see this. This is the tomb. works with the Israeli army, he's an, he's an archaeologist, and he also has a temple. 
This is this is this is where our Lord uh, rose from the grave. If you have not watched National Geographic has a phenomenal, phenomenal. Uh, it's about a forty-five minute little documentary. They just completely redid our Lord's tomb. It was literally falling apart. That steel beam on the outside of it. When I, when I first went to the Holy Land, that first three trips, it was very impressive. Uh, steel beams on the outside is filthy, just like covered in like years and years and years of incense and wax and dirt. Anyways, they completely redid it, and it really is it's magnificent. This is inside of the, the tomb. You are going inside the tomb. That actually, those are people inside the tomb praying. This is people putting their religious articles. This actually is the slab of marble that covers where our body, where our Lord's body was laid. Our Lord descends to the heaven. Uh, we're back. In the, we're in the city of Jerusalem, and the place where our Lord ascended to heaven is now a Muslim mosque. You once again pay money to get in to see where our Lord ascended to heaven. This is the little mosque that's there. That, but it's also the chapel of the Ascension. Uh, Christians are able to celebrate Mass and have official prayers that are only on the, the, the Feast of the Ascension. Uh, that's the little window. This uh, marks the spot where it is believed that there is a footprint of our Lord who might be took off uh, and ascended up into heaven. The third voice mystery is the descent of the Holy Spirit. Once again, we're in the upper room because many of the sacraments that we celebrate and many of the religious events took place in that upper room. So when we're at the church, when we're at the upper room, we, we sing songs of the Eucharist, we also sing songs uh, devoted to the Holy Spirit. Is the upper room. That is what? Then we have the fourth voice mystery, the Ascension of the Blessed Virgin Mary. There is a church known as the Dormition, a place where Mary slept or went to sleep. It um, marks the location where Mary was when she went from this world to the next. And you see this beautiful uh, image here. And the fifth glory is the according to Mary. Like I said, you have to go to heaven to see this. But there is an image in the church of the Assumption of Mary. These are just some pictures that I just want to throw. Like, that's the sun rising on the sea. Like this is what we saw every morning. If you woke up early. Um, but it was just it was magnificent. Like and for me, like I just like uh, my mom and dad went to the Holy Land before I ever did. And my mom wanted to go because they're priests, my my pastor. Uh, my, my my pastor as well when I was ordained priest, uh Father Joe McNally. He he had never been to the Holy Land. He went when he was he had turned like 68 or something. And he came back, and almost every daily mass, he would talk about it. He's like, oh yeah, like this is right over here. Like, and it's all he preached on. Once he got back from the Holy Land, he just preached. That, like, and my mom was like, I want to do that. And it's, it, is, it is terribly profound on like how our memories work. And like, when we read the Bible after you go, like, you can smell it, you can touch it, you can taste it. It's all right back there in our memory. It's really powerful. Uh, I just, I love the signs, so I just, you might see this in the back of my church. Um, a quick tie-in, just be, we go to, there, there's other sites that don't tie into the rosaries perfectly. The birthplace of John the Baptist is one of them, and uh, this church, of course, is right here, dedicated to John the Baptist, and this is where John the Baptist was born, and where his father chanted the books of the Benedictus, uh, which we pray in the official morning prayer of the church. This marks the exact spot. So once again, you see the circle of pray and touching. Uh, 
there are there are also archaeological places that we go to. So this is this is Caesarea, which is a huge archaeological site, and it really is amazing. Like there's biblical things that happened here as well. Pontius Pilate lived here. Paul was put on trial here before being shipped to Rome. There also is a huge hippodrome here, a huge theater, and thus there are public restrooms. Uh, and this, like, literally was a public restaurant. And they, Tony, he, he wanted me to show everybody. I was willing to share my gift with the group. So, uh, I celebrated my 15th anniversary of priesthood. We were in Nazareth, actually. I had the opportunity to celebrate Mass. Uh, the, uh, well, it was the Annunciation for all of us. Uh, and we had a little place uh, where we had uh, cake and whatnot afterwards. Very nice. That's, uh, actually, this is Tony, the best tour guide in the world. This is Telly, the best bus driver in the world. Uh, he's awesome. This is our group dancing. Uh, one of the most annoying things, I would say, at this year's trip is the fact that our hotel was in the middle of uh, what ended up being like the biggest party in Jerusalem that we never slept. But I think the last, I think that the music was not as bad the last maybe two nights or something. But the first few, I think mean, the first two nights, like it was unbelievable. Like, I've had my ear plugged in and the company was out of the out of control. So, I finally just said, one night, I just took the earplugs out, got dressed up again, and I'm, sort of, I'm going out in the city, like, if they're partying, like, I'm going to join them. And uh, they have, it was this festival of lights, and they had all these light displays all throughout Jerusalem. And so the last night, I asked uh, a few of the people to dance with us. So we're dancing and drawing the international crowd. This is uh, our group again on the Mount of Temptation. Where to believe that our Lord drew after he was baptized, he went out into the desert, he was tempted. This monastery is a monastery right up here, and that's uh, we through the place where our Lord was tempted by Satan. We came here for a picture, more importantly, uh, we came for camel rides and uh, to buy orange juice, uh, camel sandals. Dead sea salt beauty products. This is me with the camel jockey. He is awesome. And the beauty craving that all these other things. I someone had, I asked for people to send me pictures. And I this picture just captured me just in the sense of like, I think I like the light. I like the light. Like, I just think about like the Holy Land is transformative, like, the light of Christ, like, touches us and, like, changes us. It's a place of devotion. Of, I, I, so. Someone sent me this picture, which I was very happy about, because uh, we sing like nobody else in the Holy Land. We sing. Uh, I've developed this prayer book, this song book over the years, and it has songs for each of the sites, and it's, uh, I have a few tweaks to make to it. I always hope for more tweaks, but it really is a, a great treasure uh, to be able to sing and pray and enter into scripture in profound ways while we're there. Uh, I put this picture in here because I had two participants in the Jerusalem 5K. Uh, the walled city of Jerusalem is actually 3.1 miles. And these two knuckleheads actually did it with me, so congrats. Aww. This is where people lose a lot of money. But it is totally worth it, and it really is. They are treasures. They are treasures, treasures, treasures. But you see the store they were in. It's like a Walmart. Uh, it's not a Walmart at all, but it is a it is a co-op of, is it 60? We're going to know the last number. 60-something. 60-plus 60 families from Jerusalem, from Bethlehem, that are all Christians, that work together to provide a living for themselves. And they have the greatest hospitality and they've been trained very well. 
to do what they do. Uh, this is a great picture as well. This is uh, our last night in Jerusalem. I have everybody bring all their religious articles down to the hotel before they pack through the final packing. We bless them with holy water from Jerusalem from the River Jordan to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, for our, our, our farewell dinner, so that that's all their religious articles. And uh, I am going again in 2019, so uh, start praying about that. Start thinking if you would like to invite, or uh, if you're not gone, just to go yourself. And I'm open for questions. Any Q&As? The accommodations are nicer than any hotel you um, So there are four star, there, 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 there are four star hotels. They're very nice. I mean, they're very, very nice. Some of them, depending, like, some of them are unbelievably nice. The rest of them are just very nice. Um, we stayed in a hotel our first night that was that had only been open for four months, and it was like staying in. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. The food. Food is magnificent. I mean, like, I mean, like, I think sometimes people at lunch or whatever, like, the the food is is so good. I mean, like, it's like fresh, like vegetables, and fruit all the time. And like, uh, it's just wonderful. Like, it's so good. Yeah. There's no baloney. Ah, uh, no, the food is really, really good. Very, uh, yeah, it's very good. I don't know if I gained weight. I, 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 I'll do a check next week. Uh, bread, I, I don't eat their bread very much. Anyway, bread good? Oh, I, okay, I did buy that bread, the, that, the circle bread on the last day. Yeah, they have, they have a lot of bread. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, a lot of pita bread. A lot of pita bread. Yeah, the accommodations are very, very nice. The bus that you're on is very, very nice. Um, what? Wi-Fi and air conditioning on your bus. Seriously. Other questions? Comments of people who have gone. Only for Ray Johnson. <laughs> you do have to be you do have to be somewhat quick on sometimes what's going on because I mean, somebody, they're all there as well. Uh, so lunch can be some you have, you have to watch what's happening. Not be fearful to fight. Not fight. I'm not being a dominant. Or you just go and tell, talk to them. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Actually, so actually on that point, thank you for saying that. that yeah. Um, so those this year or last year, or maybe you've gone with another priest another time, but like, like when I tell people that like you you feel safe, like does anyone want to give like has, did, did any of you ever feel that like your life was like? I mean, I always like, tell people I feel safer there than I do like walking down town in Cincinnati. Like you feel very safe. And you also know that those who are taking you, the guide and the bus are like, that is their livelihood. Like, like, they would never take you anywhere that would be like a danger to your life. It's 
very, very soon. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the masses are all scheduled. They're, 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 they're preset. So I know going over, which is helpful for me, because what we do, I'm very big in like trying to get as many people to participate in the masses as well. So we, we know exactly what the masses are, because we have, raise your hand if when you were in the Holy Land that you did a reading or read petition. Like we, but I, they have them before they walk into the church. They know what they're reading. They know what, and that just, I think it's very powerful for people to have the opportunity to participate. So yeah, the masses are all pre-scheduled and I, I go over with, I have a binder and I got readings that we're ready to go. And uh, I'm not like putting all the priests, like that's something unique that I do because I just know that that's how powerful that is. I'm, one of the things that still touches my heart, like Martha lived the last year reading the reading at the house of Martha and Mary, and I was just like, yes, like, this is awesome, like, it was just really powerful, it was totally powerful for her, and I was just like, that is, that's a, that's a life-changing experience, to be able to do that, so, yeah, yeah, we try to accommodate those. Yeah. You were still safe. <laughs> you were still totally safe. Um, yeah, I, I, I checked this past time before we left when Ramadan was. I knew we were safe, and I actually checked again because I'm coming here and we're totally safe again. So uh, I, I learned my lesson. I'll go to prison pass every single year. And you get some people to come. You guys have to do the same thing. In fact, it's not the same songs. Like, and we want it to be the same songs. And we want it to be the same readings. Because it, 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 but we're, yeah, we're in a different place. Our life has changed. And part of the ritual that we have in the church is one of those. Yeah. Um, it's where we belong. I totally forgot it. I, 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 would, I wish I would have had a picture. No one sent me a picture. I'm not blaming anyone. Um, can someone send me? Who has? Can someone send me a picture of that? Well, anyway, so let me just tell that story real, real quick. So we had the opportunity uh, while we were there. Um, Amanda McCann, the, the, the order that she is that she is joining, has an orphanage that they run in Bethlehem. And we had the opportunity to to, to 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 go to the orphanage. They they take care of children with special needs that would either either be abandoned or or worse. Uh, and we just literally just dropped in with forty two complete strangers who we had. It was thank you to God. One of our pilgrims was completely bilingual translated uh, Spanish and it 
it was it was it was amazing. Yeah, just to see the charity and the love and the service taking place by our Christian by our Christian brothers and sisters in such a hostile place to life itself. It was, it was really, really They, and they do it in the name of Christ, which is just yeah. So that, that, yeah, every experience, every, every pilgrimage is totally different because you have you, you have it. You know, yeah, you grow in community as a you meet new people and you share your life with. Father Bullock, did you want to share anything about your experience in the Holy Land? <laughs> I didn't really want you to share anything anyway, but I, was, I did that just because I felt awkward. Right. If you want to. This is uh, one of the sales clerks at the singing the Our Father in Aramaic, which is the language that Jesus would have spoke. Uh, so he's singing in the native tongue. Right? Yes. Yeah. The hotel that we stayed at in Jerusalem has a Shroud of Turin exhibit that's very, 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 very Things are not really what you think that they're going to be. Uh, everything is a church. It's been there for the past years. Uh, so the, that trial turning to is, uh, is a great way for us to have uh, I've, I've gone to the Holy Land five times in hotels. Like, you hardly ever stay at the exact same hotel. It's all about the size of your group and the first thing. Uh, the accommodation. The hotel we were in this past time, like in Jerusalem, we like, had a church in it with the Blessed Sacrament and had a shroud turn into it. And, uh, it was pretty unique. Yeah. The house in St. Peter. Yeah, that was a great place.
Well, see, we just heard the, the uh, Our Father's Chant of Aramaic by our sales associate at the uh, Bethlehem uh, store. A great way to kind of close things is to allow yourself to view some of the olive wood products and the scarves and the pictures and the other religious articles uh, that have been bought. Those of you who have them here, that Tell stories about the people, small groups, or whatever, you're more involved in groups, or that'll be the end of our community. So let's uh, ask God to bless the promise. We're about to the Holy Spirit. Gracious Father, we thank you for this evening. We ask your blessing upon us. Help us be faithful. Help our experiences in the Holy Land and our experiences in the presentation tonight. Help us all the more to know who Jesus is and to love and serve him. Help us to be saints in your kingdom. And we ask all this through Christ. Our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.